You know, these days, I think we use the term influencer a little too loosely. I mean, anybody can post something to social media and call themselves an influencer. But there's one influencer that's been around for billions of years. She's the inspiration for this week's block in our Scraps, Strips, Strings, and Crumbs series. But she needs our help to save one of her own creations. Since I've been getting out and exploring more of nature's natural beauty, I've come to one conclusion. Mother Nature, she is the original scrap artist. I mean, who else can combine different colors, different textures, and different elements and make it look beautiful? She's full of contradictions, but somehow still manages to marry the two opposing sides and create something marvelous. Mother Nature has inspired many artists and creators throughout the centuries, and us quilters are no exception. In fact, landscape quilts have become a separate category of art quilts at many of the major quilt shows. But now, Mother Nature needs our help to raise an awareness that one of her beloved creatures is on the decline. The butterfly is a common creature that shows up in many quilt and embroidery designs. But the fact is that the population of one species of butterfly, the monarch butterfly, is rapidly declining. So to raise awareness about this declining species, well, specifically among quilters, I thought I would include a butterfly applique block in our Scraps, Strips, Strings, and Crumb series. And I'm not alone in this quest. Every year, Cherrywood Fabric sponsors a quilt challenge centered around a specific theme. The theme for 2023 is, you guessed it, the Monarch Butterfly. We won't do an exact match of the Monarch Butterfly. After all, this quilt along focuses on scrappy or multicolor. Rather, we will do the general butterfly shape. In the previous videos, we used dryer sheets to create our applique. This video will concentrate on a different applique technique called raw edge applique. I'll share my knowledge of different adhering methods of this technique, as well as talk about the different tools and materials specifically needed. And remember, if you don't want to make a butterfly, you don't have to. Make a geometric shape or make a flower. The point of this video is to demonstrate the technique of raw edge applique. So if you don't want to do a butterfly block, well, choose something that'll make you happy. And if you don't like applique altogether, well, I'm giving you permission to substitute these applique blocks with something else. So with that in mind, let's get creating. So here we have my string blocks, which measure six and a half inches. And we have some crumb blocks here, which measure four and a half inches. And depending upon whether I'm going to use these to make the applique pieces, or if I'm going to use these to do the background and pull in some other fabric to do the applique pieces, how many pieces you're going to need will depend on that fact alone. For my string blocks, I'm going to actually use these as the background. Now, remember that each of our blocks are going to be unfinished 12 and a half inches. 
since each of these string blocks measure four or sorry six and a half inches I needed four of them and what you will see me do in this video is when I put the block together I'm gonna actually just sew these or arrange these string blocks together put this use this as the background then I'm gonna start to apply my applique pieces directly onto this so each of these crumb squares measures four and a half inches. Now, since they're only four and a half inches, I kind of figured maybe they would be better off to use as my, or to make my applique pieces. So I have four of them here. I think that'll be enough to make my butterfly pattern, but that is going to heavily depend upon what butterfly pattern or what I use as my butterfly template. So let's talk about that for a second. So I have these cutouts here. This, this is just plain cardboard. I was kind of basically doing a previous butterfly project. Now these cutout pieces are actually based upon this here. This is an AccuQuilt Go. It's die number uh, 55467. And I used this die to actually cut these cardboard pieces out. Now. I'm, in this video, you're gonna see me use these cardboard pieces to actually construct the butterfly. Now, if you have a Go system and you have this particular die, again, this is die number 55467, you could use this die to create your applique pieces. You don't have to do it exactly how I'm doing it and making these cardboard templates. You know how to use the Go die and you know how to use the Go system and you have this die, go ahead and use that. I know most of you though probably don't have a go die cutting system or you might not have this particular die so I'm gonna do it using these cardboard templates just for demonstration purposes. So one thing to be aware of is that each of your applique pieces your fabric has to be big enough to fit that applique piece. I can get away with just using four because all I need is two of this piece and this is the bottom half of the wing I'll need two of these and somewhere I think I can kind of squeeze it this is the body of the butterfly so I can kind of squeeze that in somewhere in there so that's how I come up with the four pieces now if you do use another butterfly pattern design just make sure that when you do cut your individual pieces that your fabric is going to be big enough or large enough to actually fit each of those pieces. Otherwise, this whole design just won't work. Now, if you don't have the AccuQuilt Go die cutting system or you don't have any other means of maybe a butterfly template or butterfly pattern of any sort, there are a few things that you can still do. If you're confident in your drawing skills, just grab a sheet of paper and just draw a butterfly. Simple as that. And you can use that as your template. Now, if you're not confident in your drawing skills, like someone like me, well, here's another thing you can do. Now, what I have here is a printed butterfly design. I actually downloaded this from the internet and I will leave a link in the description box below so that you can download it yourself if you wanna use this particular butterfly design. Print this out and you can use this as a template to create your own butterfly template. So we talked about our fabric, we talked about our template, and again, if you have the AccuQuilt Gold Dye, you can use the Gold Dye to actually make your applique pieces. But now let's talk fusible webbing. What is a fusible web? For those of you that don't know, fusible webs what you can basically do to a fusible web, on one side of it, there's a glue here. And what you can do is then take your piece of fabric, put the back or the wrong side of the fabric on the side that has that glue. You're gonna iron it onto the fabric. On the opposite side is, it sort of feels like parchment paper. So you can actually draw your design on this paper side. Then you'll cut it out and you'll peel the paper off. And basically, then you'll be able to stick the fabric onto whatever it is 
onto your quilt, onto your quilt block, whatever it is that you want to attach it to. That's kind of the, the process of applique quilting in a nutshell using a raw edge technique and using a fusible web. There are a whole ton of different brands of fusible webs. This is the Heat & Bond, which is, which is the one I'm going to be using for the purposes of this video. I do have a Pellon here. Another very well-known brand among applique quilters or even quilt artists is the uh, Stima Seam. Um, there's a Stima Seam light and there's this regular Stima Seam. Now fusible webbings does have like a gradient system. For example, I know Stima Seam, uh, there's a Stima Seam light. I think there's a medium and I know there's a heavy. Heat and Bond also has, well, this is the Ultra Hold, which is the strongest one or the one that has the most glue. There is a Stima Seam light or there is, sorry, a Heat and Bond light. And basically the, that gradient system kind of determines how much glue that there is on each one of these fusible webs. The more glue there is, well, there's potential for problems. I do know a lot of quilt artists and a lot of applique quilters that use this fusible web or this raw edge applique technique. They do tend to go for the fusible webs that are more on the lighter side. This is because they do not want the material, the glue material, sometimes it can rub off on your needle and when it gets on your needle and gets into your sewing machine in particular, it can do some serious damage. Yeah, ask me how I know. Again, I'm using this Heat & Bond Ultra Hold because it's what I had and this is leftover that I want to use up from a previous project. You don't have to get the Ultra Hold, you can probably get away with the light version. If you have your own personal favorite type of fusible webbing that you want to use, I say go ahead and use it. I haven't noticed a difference in terms of the brand. I do notice a difference in terms of whether it's the light, medium, or heavy. Use the fusible web that you want to use. You don't have to use the Heat & Bond brand that I'm using for this video. I did go through my larger fabric scraps and I pulled out this particular fabric piece here. For the string version or the string block that I'm gonna do, this fabric is gonna be used to make the applique pieces. But for the crumb blocks or the crumb version, hopefully this is gonna be large enough so that I can actually just use this as the background fabric, but we'll see. Hmm, so I think that's all I wanted to say about the fabric requirements and the materials needed. Okay, let's start making our applique pieces. Let's start by first making our applique pieces. Now, as I've mentioned before, I'm using the Heat & Bond Ultra Hold, but you can use the brand that you prefer. Be sure that you read the manufacturer's instructions on how to use the fusible web, as each brand is slightly different. Most fusible webs that I've seen have a glue side which usually has a shiny, rougher texture. The opposite side is the paper side where you can use a pen, pencil, or some other writing tool to trace the design. Here you see me trace the butterfly pattern to the paper side of the fusible web. I'm using my purple cutting mat and that green circle thing to hold the fusible web down so that it doesn't coil back onto the roll. Now in certain areas, I scribbled some markings. This is to indicate that this area is an overlapping area. What that means is that when I start laying out the applique pieces, that section will have another applique piece layered over it. Now there's something I forgot to mention earlier, so I'll say it here. When choosing your applique design, you'll want to choose a design that is vertically symmetrical, or the left and right sides are mirror images of each other. This is because the fusible web will get ironed onto the back of the fabric, then everything gets flipped over when you start applique stitching the pieces down to your background. In other words, the wings on the right side of the design will end up being the wings on the left side in the final block. Now, butterflies are vertically symmetrical or the right and left sides look very similar, so it will not matter much on this design. 
However, when you have a design where the left and right sides are not similar, such as this letter E, the end result will be a backwards letter E. But it's not the end of the world. Just trace your design backwards onto the paper side of the fusible. Turn the design over, then you can start tracing. Use a light box if you have one or hold up the design to a window and let nature help you. Now if you're using some kind of template such as one that I have here with these cardboard cutouts, pay attention to the orientation when tracing it onto the fusible web because remember you must trace it on backwards. Now once you have all your pieces traced to the paper side of the fusible web, do a rough cut to separate the pieces. What I mean is, you see, I'm not cutting directly on the trace lines. Instead, I'm cutting about a quarter inch to a half inch away. We're just trying to separate the pieces instead of working with one gigantic fusible web piece. Take the glue side of the fusible web and iron it to the wrong side of the fabric. Now this is where you will need to read the manufacturer's instructions because each brand of fusible web is different in terms of what settings to use on your iron, how long you are supposed to iron it, or even whether or not the fabric should be on top and the fusible on the bottom or vice versa. So be sure to read those instructions. After I ironed the fusible web to the back of the fabric and let it cool down, I use the scissors to cut each piece out and this time I'm cutting on the trace line. Then I can peel the paper off from the applique piece. You may find it easier to use a pin to score the paper, then peel it off. There should be a shiny film-like layer that is stuck to the wrong side of the fabric. Let's talk background for a minute. When doing applique, I like to cut a background slightly bigger than the size I need. This is because sometimes as you are stitching the applique pieces, the background can get pulled in and shrink the block just a little, especially if you have a lot of applique pieces on the block. So I will usually make the background a quarter to about a half an inch bigger than I need. This is not an essential step, but one that I keep in the back of my mind. I'm using these six and a half inch string blocks as my background for one of the butterflies. I'm sewing these together with a very narrow scant quarter inch, which will give me a little wiggle room if the background shrinks. For the other block, I will use a larger scrap fabric cut to a 12 and three quarter inch square. We have everything ready, so let's lay it all out and begin putting this block together. If you have it, you can use your printout to help with the placement. Now, if you want to get everything centered, you can fold the background fabric in half vertically and horizontally to find the center. Then you can lay it over the printout and eyeball it to center the design. Place each piece by matching it to the printout. Now keep in mind that some designs have multiple layers. Remember that I did put scribble marks on areas where there will be overlap. The pieces that should be on the very bottom, well those pieces should get placed down first. Then layer on the next piece and the next piece. Now, if you don't have any kind of printout to help you with the placement, just eyeball it the best you can or until you are satisfied with how it looks. If you want to, you can pin the pieces in place to temporarily hold them. Once you're satisfied with the layout, go back to your ironing board and iron on the applique pieces to adhere them to the background fabric. Remember to take out those pins. And again, make sure you follow the manufacturer's instructions on this step. Let the block cool for a minute and we are ready to machine stitch the applique pieces down. I'm going to have to switch to a different sewing machine than my normal Juki. The Juki only does a straight stitch. Now, one thing about applique or raw edge applique in particular, I like to use a zigzag stitch to actually stitch on or kind of top stitch the edges of the applique pieces down to the background. 
The Juki is a straight stitch only. You can just do a straight top stitch. I don't like to do that. I like to have some kind of stitch where it stitches on the applique piece and then it sti also stitches on the background. If this were going to just be a wall hanging quilt, I would be fine with just doing a straight stitch right here alongside the edge. But since I am going to be putting this particular quilt into the wash, and I'm actually going to be using it. What I do find is that a lot of times the applique pieces over time, as I wash it, it starts to kind of curl inward. And I don't like that. So I'm going to do a zigzag stitch uh, to actually get these pieces down. Find whatever stitch that you like. If you want to do a blanket stitch, you can do a blanket stitch. If you just want to do a straight stitch along the edges, that's also fine. That's your own personal preference. I'm starting with the body because that is the topmost piece. And I'm just trying to find the longest edge. And I put the needle down. The needle's like right there on the edge. I'm going to just start. And it's going to zig and zag back and forth. Um, again, I got the stitch length to about a one and a half and I'm switching the stitch width or the zigzag distance to about a two millimeter. See how that looks. Of course, I should have actually tested this out before. Yeah, that looks much better. Okay, and then I'm coming up to a curve, so I'm going to stop, pivot a little bit, and then just kind of take it slow. One more stitch. Okay, and, you know, these don't have to be like perfect stitches at all. As long as they just hold the applique piece down, you'll be fine. That's a gentle curve, so I can kind of manipulate that. And here we go. We are hitting the straightaway, so I can start speeding up there. Coming up to the next curve. And lift the foot up. I'm going to pivot a little bit, and we'll go... Lift up a little more, take a stitch, okay, and then I'll turn it all the way. Got to reverse back because I took one too many stitches that time. And let's pivot. Now if you do have a needle down option, this is the time to use it because you do want to make sure that when you turn your coil, the needle is down so that you can kind of pivot around and my thread came out oh boy when your thread if you do have a thread break or if you run out of bobbin for whatever reason if you do need to stop okay what i like to do is when i restart again i like to just overlap the stitches a little bit just to kind of secure it down i just find that it secures it down a little more and it kind of put make sure that the uh thread wherever the thread broke or wherever your bobbin thread ran out whatever caused you to stop it kind of makes sure that that part doesn't unravel i'm approaching the start i will again overlap the stitches by maybe one or two stitches just to make sure that it's secure and in place cut our thread okay so we just got all of that center body stitched down and we're going to go ahead and well first of all I'm going to cut these loose threads so that I don't get that all tangled in. Now I'm going to go ahead and get started on each of these the wing section here so I'm going to speed up the camera because it's pretty much the same thing. I'll put the needle down. Okay let's start going.
So here is the first version or the string version of the butterfly block. And there's a few things that I kind of wanted to point out. Number one, when you stitch down the applique pieces, you can't really see it unless you really get up close to this, but the stitches are not really, well, they're not really consistent and they're kind of all over the place if you really look up close. Here, I can kind of say these look good, but here I can kind of tell that when the needle went onto the background, it went a little too far. You do want to, if you are using a type of stitch like a blanket stitch or a zigzag stitch, you want to make sure or you want to get the needle as close to the edge of the applique piece as you can possibly get it and then stitch onto the applique piece itself. If your stitches are all over the place, don't sweat it or don't even worry about it. So long as you got one stitch on the background and one stitch on the applique piece, you'll be fine. Now one thing that will help with that. Notice that I chose a thread that is kind of well, it's not very noticeable here. And the fabrics, well, there are all sorts of colors. This thread is actually a really light blue, but you really can't tell because, well, it kind of matches or blends in with the applique piece here with that pastel color like. So when you choose a thread in doing applique, you can either choose a matching thread or choose a thread that doesn't show up. Now, if you are going to do some kind of a decorative stitch where you want to see those stitches, then of course you want to choose a thread that actually highlights that decorative stitch. So here is the second block. I do want to point out that the applique or the zigzag stitches, again, very inconsistent, but this time it is a little bit more noticeable. That's simply because of the fact that I didn't use a thread color that would hide. Who knows? I mean, does it really matter to me? Not really. Am I going to care about it? Definitely not. Generally speaking, people try to match the thread color to the background so that it just kind of blends in a little better. I don't know if that's really true. Then again, when you look at this quilt from a distance, you're definitely not going to even see some of these stitches. Choose your thread colors wisely is the point. <laughs> You know, I did a little bit of research in preparation for this particular quilt block, and I found some pretty interesting facts about the monarch butterfly. You see, scientists are tracking some of these monarch butterflies. There's a sanctuary down in, or a monarch butterfly sanctuary down in Mexico, and the monarch butterfly is a migratory insect. Insect, creature, you know what I mean. Scientists have actually been keeping track of where these monarch butterflies are coming from down in Mexico. And some of them, they've been able to track some of these butterflies that flew all the way from southern Canada. Can you imagine that? I mean, you're talking hundreds upon thousands of miles and this little creature is migrating from Canada all the way down south to Mexico. You know, I can barely even walk the stairs just to get the mail and I'm out of breath sometimes. This little creature gets my thumbs up for traveling that far. Now, even here in the US, there's actually a migratory monarch butterfly that goes from east to west, and scientists have been noting that the population of that particular species of monarch butterflies is also on the decline. The people in Mexico, they were saying that when the monarch butterflies would arrive, they would occupy acres and acres of land. And over the years, it's been shrinking. You know, when I was growing up 10, 20, do I want to give my age away? You know, these days it's not uncommon for us to have category four, maybe even possibly category five hurricane level will be in the near future. Tornadoes are happening a lot more frequently. Icebergs are melting. I mean, there's a lot of issues going around the world and I don't know. I think there is something to this where we do have to start paying attention to it. I mean, it's not uncommon for record temperatures to go above 100 degrees Fahrenheit now. So we're breaking records, people, and not the good ones. Mm -mm. Some people think all of this is just hobo hogwash or it's just 
They don't believe it. They don't believe in global warming. They just say, they're just saying that this is the Earth's natural cycle. To some degree, yes, that is true. Scientists across the world, when you got all of them saying the same message, there's got to be something to it. And they're all saying that global warming is real. And yet some people don't want to say anything or don't want to believe it. I do know some countries in the South Pacific where water levels have risen so high that it's now threatening their own homelands in which a lot of these low lying levels or low land areas, they're just getting covered with water, sad to say. So their homes are disappearing. And these people are screaming at the top of their lungs, hey, global warming is real, but yet the world in general, all these high powered people don't wanna listen. But where are you on this issue? I mean, do you believe that global warming is real? Do you believe that this is just the Earth's natural cycle? Or are you really concerned about it? Even as quilters, we do have some power and some influence to start raising awareness about these issues. But do you believe that we have a problem? Put a comment down below. You know, just share your own opinions. Now let's all be respectful because I know that people can get very heated on an issue like this. So let's just be open-minded and let's just be respectful of each other and not criticize each other. And along that line, there's another issue that I've been kind of keeping my eye on and that's the use of plastics. I've been seeing pictures around the world, especially in the Pacific area or within the Pacific Ocean where there's a lot of plastic washing up on beaches. And the last time that I went back home to Hawaii, I saw it for myself and how bad it's really getting. There's plastic cups and little pieces of plastic shards that are just washing up in beaches all over the, uh, all over the Pacific. And well, this issue about usage of plastics is becoming pretty real. Now, I'm not one that's going to advocate, oh, no, we should get rid of all plastics, you know, because, I mean, hello, I do store my fabrics in plastic containers. You know, but it brings up an issue of being wasteful, being or properly disposing of things, even recycling plastics. I mean, a lot of the plastics that we do use can get recycled. But sometimes these recycling rules, I mean, they can, they can get a little ridiculous. You put your plastics in this bin, plastics with that grade go in that bin, all your organic matter goes in this bin, but if it's food related, it goes there. Aluminum in that can, but if it's a soda can, it goes in there. I mean, I, don't, I wouldn't blame people for just not doing any recycling because they make it so complicating paper in there, but your junk mail has to get shredded and then put over there. And if it's shred, oh wait, if it's shredded, no, it has to go in the trash because you can't recycle that. It's overly complicating. And I just wish there was a way to simplify it. Maybe you don't believe in this whole global warming thing. Maybe you just think it's a hoax, but do you recycle? Now that is one where there's a lot of people who do and a lot of people who don't. And I see it both ways because recycling, yeah, I mean, when you got to sort everything, there's all these lists of different rules. I don't blame people for not doing it. Me personally, I try to recycle when I can. I try my best at it. I'm not perfect at it. But again, where are you on these issues about global warming, about the environment? Do you believe that global warming is real? Do you recycle? Do you reuse plastics or do you try to go for more paper products? Put a comment down below. Let me know or let all of us know, are you a believer or are you not? And here are my two butterfly blocks. Now, both of these blocks, well, they should be about 12 and a half inches. In looking at this block, there, there are certain things that I might change or I might have done maybe a little differently. Say, for example, what if I turned this applique piece and put it on point? That's a thought. Or what if I actually used the string blocks to make the applique piece on this one? You know, just look at the design, think about how you want your block to look, and well, just give it some thought. 
Pay attention to the thread color that you use when you are stitching down your applique pieces. Do you want it to be a little bit more visible or do you want it to kind of sink or not be so visible and let the applique piece kind of stand out? Choice is yours. And try not to beat yourself up about being so perfect with your applique stitches. This is the one where I totally messed it up, but can you see it? Maybe you can, maybe you can. And if it's gonna bother you, well, of course you can rip it out, but uh, this isn't gonna bother me at all. So I'm just leaving it as it is. Well, that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed making your own butterfly block. And if you didn't wanna do a butterfly, well, do a geometric shape, do a flower, do something that'll make you happy. The point to this video was to learn about the applique technique. The butterfly design was just sort of a added benefit, I guess. <laughs> well, if you like this video, hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. And don't forget to post pictures of your creations on the Treasure Heart Facebook group. If you're not a member of the Treasure Heart Creations Facebook group, well, link is in the description below. Let's get you signed up. Well, that's it for now. Let's all go out there and let's create something. <music>